In 1961, President Kennedy called on all Americans to rise to the challenges of the day. He knew that success depended upon the unity of efforts throughout the federal government and the nation. In a memorandum he wrote, I want coordination of government activities outside of Washington significantly strengthened across departments and agency lines. From this, federal executive boards were born. The Greater Boston Federal Executive Board, one of 28 across the country, fosters communication, coordination, and collaboration with federal, state, and local government agencies. It is our hope that through this series, folks will learn about the mission and work done by different agencies, what that means for our country, and more specifically, what that means to each of us as individuals. This is your federal government, and I am your host, Diane LeBlanc. Hello everyone. Today we are featuring the Diplomatic Security Service, which is part of the United States Department of State. The Diplomatic Security Service is responsible for providing a safe and secure environment for the conduct of U.S. foreign policy. Operating from a global platform in 30 U.S. cities in over 160 foreign countries, the service ensures that America can conduct diplomacy safely and securely. In the United States, diplomatic security personnel protect the Secretary of State and high-ranking foreign dignitaries and officials visiting the United States. Diplomatic security also plays a vital role in protecting U.S. embassies and personnel overseas, securing critical information systems, investigating passport and visa fraud, and fighting the war on terror. We are very fortunate to have the senior leadership for this area with us today, Todd Ziccarelli, special agent in charge of the Boston Field Office, and Michael Flynn, the assistant special agent in charge of the Boston Field Office. Gentlemen, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having us here. You know, Todd, I'm going to begin with you. Okay. Tell me a little bit about diplomatic security. Sure. The Diplomatic Security Service is the law enforcement and security arm of the U.S. Department of State. If you wanted to boil our mission down into one sentence, it would be to provide a secure environment for the conduct of American diplomacy. We operate in a global platform in protecting over 280 U.S. embassies and consulates around the world in more than 160 foreign countries. We truly are a worldwide organization with the, our large global footprint. Overseas, we're charged with protecting our diplomats and our embassies and consulates and families as well. We're also safeguarding U.S. property in our embassies and, and U.S. government buildings. And we also protect classified information and sensitive information. Closer to home in the States, we have uh, over 30 offices and eight larger offices, of which Boston is one. Um, the, the Boston office covers the entire New England region with the exception of Connecticut. And the focus of the, of the field office is to investigate passport and visa fraud, to protect the Secretary of State and visiting foreign dignitaries, and to protect foreign consulates. And we truly are, um, because of our global presence, we, we also serve as a liaison between U.S. law enforcement and foreign law enforcement and are able to assist in bringing fugitives back to justice from overseas. Wow. <laughs> quite, quite a mission, quite a, a responsibility. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in particular the Boston office uh, does passport and visa fraud. What exactly is passport and visa fraud? Sure. Passport fraud, in its simplest terms, is when someone applies for a passport in a false identity. It could be a foreigner wishing to come to the United States, or it could even be a U.S. citizen applying in someone else's identity. Mm -hmm. And for us, the passport is considered uh, probably the most coveted document in the world because it denotes U.S. citizenship, and it also facilitates travel to and from many countries around the world. Um, visa on the other, visas, on the other hand, are a little bit different. Um, those are for foreigners wishing to come to the U.S., whether it's to live, uh, 
uh, reside here, um, whether it's to work here for a short stay or even for pleasure. Visas are issued by our consulates and embassies overseas. And the visa, visa fraud occurs when someone either um, misrepresents their identity on an application, submits fraudulent documentation in, sort of, in support of the application, or they mis misrepresent their, um, their purpose for coming to the United States. And, um, the Department of State investigates passport and visa fraud because it can, uh, it's a serious threat to our national security and individual safety. Um, the crimes often uh, uh, don't occur in a vacuum but actually serve as a gateway to other criminal activities such as terrorism, drug trafficking, alien smuggling, child molestation, financial fraud, and even identity theft which we hear so much about today. Okay, Mike, your turn. <laughs> Todd also mentioned the protection of foreign dignitaries. What type of dignitaries do you protect? How do you protect them? Sure. Well, to start, um, how we protect them. Um, by protecting them, we mean keeping them safe during their entire visit to our area. Um, it's, uh, it's a large task, and there's a lot of planning that goes into it before the dignitary arrives. Um, we'll usually meet with the dignitary's delegation beforehand, get their schedule. Um, our agents will take this schedule, they'll go out to each venue, um, do a site survey of this venue, um, find it, come up with an overall security plan for any emergencies w which may come up. Um, then we'll start running routes between um, the different venues, between the hotel, between the hospitals, come up with the, the quickest and most expedient and safest routes between all these areas. Um, depending on the schedule and the threat against the dignitary, we'll come up with what agent manpower we need. Do we need to employ armored vehicles? Um, and throughout the entire process, we have support from our local police departments. Um, we don't do this without the Boston Police Department, Massachusetts State Police, uh, many of the university police departments. We get great support from them. So lots of planning, lots of lead time. Necessary, Sometimes not ideally, much lead time. But, but you probably right. don't get what you need all the time. But uh, strong partnerships with, with local, state, and I'm guessing other federal law enforcement entities. Definitely. We could not do this Good. without them. We usually get uh, extra police officers. We'll get um, lead and tail cars for our motorcades. We'll even have motorcycles if needed. Okay. So, Todd, you, you also mentioned foreign consulates. What, what is a foreign consulate? Well, it, it can be a little tricky. Uh, most countries have an embassy which is in the capital city. So for us in the United States, uh, embassies are found in Washington, D.C. However, foreign government representation outside of Washington, D.C. is called a consulate. And so um, a consulate could really best be described as a, a natural extension or an arm of the embassy. And they provide a host of services to the foreign nationals that either live, um, that work here, or maybe that are just traveling through the area. And they also, a consulate also um, serves to further the development between the two countries uh, in, in terms of uh, economic relations, commercial relations, cultural relations, trying to, um, to strengthen the ties between, once again, the host government and the foreign government. And I think the best examples of consulates you might find is uh, here in, in Boston, you've got the Irish consulate. There's many consulates. Uh, in Chicago, you have a Polish consulate. On the West Coast, in San Francisco and L.A., you've got Chinese consulates. One of the common themes that you'll find is you've got a large community of expatriates uh, in those communities. So the other thing is some consulates will issue visas. So if a U.S. citizen, for example, in the Boston area is uh, thinking about traveling to that particular country, they should check with the consulate um, and, and they may issue visas where you can get it done right then and there. Okay, so you've explained what a consulate is and, and very well. Mm -hmm. But now how and, and why do you protect them? Yeah, well, under the Vienna Convention, Every host government is responsible for, for providing a secure environment for the, for the foreign government's uh, diplomatic and consular activity. And the U.S. government takes this very seriously because um, we ask for assistance for our embassies and consulates overseas. So it's in terms of reciprocity, uh, we want to be able to do the same for uh, foreign governments here in our country. Um, we partner with the local police as far as keeping the facility safe and the diplomatic and consular personnel in the facilities. Um, this could be additional police presence around a facility or it could be enhanced police presence if there's going to be a large public event like a national day reception, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the passport and, and visa fraud, the investigations. Mike, how do you, how do you begin those investigations? Um, passport and visa frauds are, are crimes that are usually part of a, a larger criminal enterprise or associated with other criminal acts. 
Um, so we um, have a, a lot of partnerships with many of the federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Um, and through their, um, their larger investigations, um, we're privy to, um, to uh, records and, and um, different parts of their investigations, which lead to our passport fraud and visa fraud investigations. Um, we work closely here with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, Social Security Administration, Department of Labor, and the Boston Police Department and Providence Police Department. Okay. So what, what kind of passport and visa cases have you investigated here in New England? We've had a number of high-profile uh, high passport fraud cases recently. Um, this past September um, in Providence, mm -hmm. a Russian citizen was found guilty and sentenced to four years in, in prison for assuming the identity of a um, U.S. national who was also, also an Irish citizen. Um, he had assumed his identity. He had um, applied for U.S. passport, Social Security cards, and uh, also a mortgage. Um, Recently, an Antiguan national was sentenced to three and a half years in order to pay $198,000 in restitution in Maine. He had assumed uh, an American citizen's identity in the 1980s um, and had lived under this identity for years, had uh, received a number of passports, a number of uh, Social Security cards. Um, he had uh, received U.S. government benefits um, for um, food and housing mm -hmm. over the years. So we've, we've now mentioned identity theft, which just causes horrible, horrible problems for, for the victims. What can folks do to protect themselves? Uh, sure. Um, most importantly, I would recommend guarding your personal and financial information. Um, only provide your credit card and bank account number when you are actually paying for something with it. Um, lock up your important documents, such as your, your social security card or birth certificate. Um, try and keep these locked up at home. Um, try and monitor your monthly credit card and bank statements for discrepancies and be sure to report any missing credit cards or identification documents immediately. Um, ensure that your incoming and outgoing mail is in a secure location um, as it sometimes contains account numbers and personal information. Don't click on links in unsolicited emails and exercise caution when providing information on the internet. Um, don't disclose credit card or other financial account numbers on the website unless the site offers secure transactions and encrypted transactions. Um, and be wary of anyone requesting personal or financial information from you, especially if they should already have it. Um, criminals pretending to be from companies you do business with may call or send an email um, claiming that they need to verify your personal information. Before responding, contact the company directly to confirm the email or call is in fact from them. Good advice. Mm -mm. Very good advice. So, Todd, any other notable visa fraud cases that have been investigated by your office? Yeah, we've completed a number of notable cases, visa fraud cases, over the past year. Um, one such case involved a Dominican national who owned and operated the country's largest asbestos abatement training or uh, uh, school. And in her case, um, after an extensive investigation, revealed that she had sold training certificates to thousands of illegal aliens that actually had not completed the training. And um, even worse, um, she had provided documentation to encourage these illegals to um, come to the states and remain here illegally. Um, she was arrested back in 2008 and fled the country to the Dominican Republic, her homeland. Uh, we worked closely with our colleagues at the embassy there, our, our special agent colleagues. They were able to locate her, track her down. We, she was extradited and then just last year in the District of Massachusetts here in Boston, she had her trial and uh, was convicted and eventually sentenced to more than seven years um, in jail. Uh, this was a uh, case that we worked very closely with the EPA, their Criminal Investigation Division, another example of how we partner with other agencies. Um, more recently, in January of this year, we con uh, completed an extensive investigation regarding uh, on an American citizen of Cambodian descent who lives in the North Shore area. And in this case, he had um, committed more than 20 cases of marriage and visa fraud by wow. um, petitioning, falsely petitioning for Cambodians to come to the United States. And as a result of, uh, of this case, he was sentenced in the District of Vermont and um, to one year in prison plus, or 15 months in prison plus a year of supervised probation. So, so these cases, I'm guessing no two are exactly alike and, and complicated for a variety of reasons. Um, they go on for a number of years, or, or how um, long does it take you to process a case? Well, the, the most complicated ones are, are always multi-year investigations. And uh, another, maybe uh, the best example of that is one that was uh, completed actually earlier this year, uh, which was called Operation Maine Car Wash. This was a multi-year investigation with our federal partners, um, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and also the Department of Labor, to name a few. 
And um, in this case, uh, there were five defendants that were um, encouraging bringing uh, illegals to the United States, mostly from uh, Brazil. But in, they were uh, manipulating the um, guest worker visa program, providing documentation to get the illegals here, um, placing them in jobs in the uh, hotel and service industry. Um, the, the end result was the five defendants have all been convicted and uh, are serving sentences in jail ranging from two to five years. All have been ordered deported back to Brazil following the completion of their sentence. And perhaps the best thing is the government has seized nearly a million dollars in assets wow. uh, as a result of this investigation. Wow. Yeah. And, and I mean, as you said earlier, the visa fraud and the passport fraud, they relate to all of these other kinds of crimes and illegal, illegal activities that, that folks are, are involved in. Mm -hmm. Mike, what should somebody do if they suspect that someone has committed passport or visa fraud? Uh, they should call our office at 617-565-8200 uh, and request to speak with an agent and we'll take down all the, uh, the details of, of what they suspect. Um, most importantly, if you do suspect someone it, um, is committing passport or visa, fra visa fraud, uh, we just ask that you don't confront them. Give our office a call and we'll, we'll look into it. Um, I should also note too, um, if you need information for applying for a passport, renewing a passport, if you've lost a passport, um, we recommend you call the, uh, the State Department's toll-free number or you go to the Department of State's uh, website, the Bureau of Consular Affairs, and they'll have information relating to passport applications and renewals. So this is pretty serious business, and I'm guessing, you know, it's, it's good folks, they keep their eyes and their ears open if they suspect something they really should call, but some folks might feel uneasy about that. Can they re remain anonymous Most if definitely. they call? Yes. Okay. So, so they don't need to, to be fearful? No, no. Please call our office. Uh, we'll take down all the details. We'll look into it from there, and we'll give you any advice that we think is warranted at the time. Okay. Todd also mentioned earlier um, that the Boston office is one of the eight larger offices um, across the country. Are there any other satellite offices that you operate here in New England? We do. We have two other offices in the area. We have a um, resident office in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we also have another office in St. Albans, Vermont, which is just north of uh, um, Burlington, Vermont. Um, throughout the area, we have uh, a team of um, highly experienced agents that are involved in uh, the DS mission throughout New England. And at any one time, we're going to have agents that are traveling with the secretary overseas or assigned to Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, the embassies. Um, overseas, pr providing security support over there. Wow, you guys are busy. Todd, you also talked about your office protecting foreign diplomats. What, is, what does that mean for the area that you're responsible for? Do we get a lot of foreign diplomats in our area? Yeah, we do. I mean, every city in the United States has its unique aspects. Um, and the best example in New York City, of course, you've got Wall Street, you've got the United Nations. Washington is the, the seat of the government. But even here in Boston, you've got some of the finest universities and, and hospitals in the world, and those uh, will attract a, a great number of dignitaries. Over the past year, we've uh, worked a number of four visits that come to mind. Um, the first was a Chinese state counselor that was here for a week last spring. Last fall, the Turkish foreign minister was visiting Vermont for a couple of days following the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, more recently, the um, Vietnamese Deputy Prime Minister was in town for a week uh, for a symposium at Harvard University. Just last month, the, the Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister was in town for a number of events at a, a nearby university. So, um, yeah, we do get a lot of visits here. And um, every time, it's always a lot of long hours, um, a lot of hard work, and something that requires constant vigilance. Um, I'd also like to note there was one time uh, back in 2009, Dalai Lama visited Boston for five days. Um, that's usually one of our largest details. Um, he met with some of the religious leaders, political leaders in the area, and even held a public event at, at Gillette Stadium. So public events, I'm guessing, are, are pretty challenging. Have there ever been any serious incidents surrounding these visits? Um, there haven't been, but it's not because of uh, sheer luck or by accident. It all starts, as uh, Mike mentioned, with, with proper planning. Um, going out and visiting the sites, uh, meeting with the local police. We also gather intelligence from a number of different sources. We get it from our headquarters, of course. And then with our federal partners in the area, um, the FBI, for example. Uh, and then over the internet, just open source information sometimes can be very useful, some of the information there. From time to time, we'll get stuff from our headquarters that's, that's classified threat information. Um, obviously, in this forum, I can't um, disclose mm -hmm. that. but. 
um, really by the time the dignitary arrives, uh, we've, we've put everything together, we've got a solid game plan. Um, we scripted a number of scenarios, sort of a what if, in case uh, A happens, you know, what is our response, okay? It could be to a demonstration, it could be to severe weather, or it could be just uh, um, trying to get around the city because of the Boston Marathon or something mm -hmm. like that. So uh, we really try to uh, take into account anything that could come along the way. Um, it also should be noted, as uh, Mike mentioned, that we employ a number of, uh, we use armored vehicles, we partner with the police and so forth. Um, we really, the bottom line or the goal here is to provide a, a visible deterrent to someone that's contemplating uh, carrying out an attack against our principal or simply just interfering with movements along the way. Um, if you've done all your homework, um, it, it doesn't guarantee anything, but it's super, it, it certainly uh, will increase the chances of a successful visit. Okay. Let's go back to the foreign consulates. Um, you explained yeah. what a foreign consulate was, but Mike, uh, how much interaction does your office actually have with foreign consulates? How many foreign consulates do we have in our area? Sure. Um, well, in the Boston area, we have 85 consulates, um, and we have quite a bit of interaction with them. We have a, a team of agents um, that their primary mission is liaison with, with the, the foreign consulates here. Um, and their, their mission overall is to ensure a, a safe um, working environment for the diplomats and their families while they're here. Um, again, we enjoy great partnerships uh, and working relationships with the Boston Police, Brookline Police Department, and Newton um, Police Departments, where many of these, these consulates are, are located. Um, and we're engaged with them on a, a number of levels. Um, we have, uh, when they travel through Logan Airport, um, we work with Customs and Border Protection at the airport to ensure their, their safe um, travel through the th uh, arrival and departure through the airport. Um, if they have an international day event, um, we'll uh, craft a security plan to address that. Um, we're very attuned to their security here because um, when Todd and I are, are working overseas, we're much in the same position they are, where we have to rely on our local police and security contacts to ensure our safety. Todd, talk about the training that's necessary for you and, and your staff to be able to, to do their jobs effectively. Yeah, well, we're, we're very fortunate. Uh, without a doubt, diplomatic security provides some of the, the finest training in the federal government and really prepares us to carry out our duties in a, a safe and efficient manner. It all starts right up front when we're hired. We undergo a rigorous six-month training program. Um, we will get a, a lot of classroom study doing uh, both legal uh, and so forth. And then we actually have a lot of hands-on with firearms, administering first aid, um, conducting how to execute properly a search warrant uh, and arrest warrant. Uh, how to conduct surveillance, and also um, non-lethal non use of force using our batons and, and pepper spray. So that's really the foundation for us. Mm -hmm. And then um, as we progress in our careers, uh, when we go overseas after a few years stateside, we'll get additional training, which builds upon the, the, the first training we had and actually prepares us a little better for working in the overseas environment, interacting with uh, colleagues in the embassy and with uh, security officials. And there's, um, there's even specialized training for those persons that are going to some of our highest threat countries, for example, going to Iraq or Afghanistan. They spend, spend a little extra time um, dealing with weapons and administering first aid, um, learning about um, uh, dealing with um, explosions and so forth. Could, could you work for the Diplomatic Security Service and not be willing to take an assignment overseas? Could you limit yourself to sort of the Boston office if that if that was your home? I mean generally speaking uh, we're in there, there's uh, the bulk of the agents are foreign service which means you're worldwide available and you have to agree up front that you'll be uh, uh, agree to go overseas live and serve overseas at least once every five years. And that sounded like some pretty in impressive and intensive training mm -hmm. that you get you know that foundation training when you first come on then mm -hmm. as you're on the job you get training do you do any of that training here in boston or are you yeah well the place? actually i mean uh, we also do uh, some other training as well like um, high speed uh, maneuvers with vehicles motorcades which prepares for our dignitary protection duties um, some of that stuff, obviously, we can't do here in Boston. I don't think the locals would appreciate that too much. Um, but we still do a lot of practice with our firearms, for example. Um, we use some ranges. The local police, a couple of local police departments have been uh, generous enough to extend the courtesy to use the ranges so we can practice their firearms. We do things like practicing uh, serving arrest warrant and a search warrant. And actually, that's probably one of the most dangerous parts of the job because you're dealing with uh, felons and, and uncooperative people. 
Um, another thing is we're required to do physical fitness uh, tests three times a year. That encompasses sit-ups, push-ups, and a mile and a half run, which we usually do that as a group along Starro Drive. and makes it a little easier for everyone. And, and that, that foot trail or that path yeah. that goes right along the, the river. Right. So, Mike, diplomatic security service is also a key player in the fight against international terrorism. What does that mean? Well, first and foremost, um, DS agents are part of um, 26 joint terrorism task forces um, throughout the United States, um, or JTTFs as we call them. JTTFs are committed to um, countering terrorist threats in the United States and against U.S. interest overseas. Um, here in Boston, we have three agents assigned to local JTTFs, one in Boston, one in Bedford, New Hampshire, and one in Logan Airport, which is the first of its kind, um, in a JTTF dedicated to um, cases coming out of Logan um, Airport. Um, the JTTFs are, are, as I said, comprised of all manner of federal, state, and local um, law enforcement organizations. Um, they all bring their individual expertise um, and their own knowledge of um, their, their local areas. Um, for DS, we bring um, knowledge and expertise in um, sensitive passport visa fraud investigations, along with the added benefit of having contacts in embassies throughout the world where we can have record checks run or, or um, ask about local investigations. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, um, that's great. Todd, when I was uh, preparing for this, I uh, read a little bit about the Rewards for Justice program. Tell, tell folks, yeah, what, 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 what is that? And, and, and then I'm going to come back okay. to my little props this, here. This is a great program. It started in 1984 and authorizes the State Department mm -hmm. to pay rewards for information that leads to the capture, arrest, and conviction um, of anyone that plans, commits, or attempts international terrorist attacks against the United States and our citizens and, and our property. Um, rewards can also be paid for information that, that disrupts terrorism financing. And the rewards normally range from anywhere in the hundreds of thousands for up to, up to $25 million, but the, the average is usually under $5 million. And to date, since 1984, the department has paid more than $100 million to 70 individuals who have provided uh, real actionable information. And the largest payments to date were $30 million for information that led to the capture and arrest of Saddam Hussein's sons, uh, Uday and Kuse. This was obviously a few mm -hmm. years back. Um, another well-publicized um, success was the capture, was information that was provided for the capture of Ramzi Youssef. He was one of the 1993 mm -hmm. World Trade Center mm -hmm. bombers. Um, and, and the information was actually given a couple years after the fact, or he was located overseas. Um, and, and brought to justice, but all as a response to someone um, seeing this program or, or getting the word out and someone acting on it. So, so how do you promote the program? Well, we use, uh, in addition to the RFJ website, we use a, a variety of methods. Matchbooks, yeah. for example, I think you're holding a couple yeah. um, little things like that, uh, pens and so forth. Paid advertisements are really the biggest way. It could be uh, ads in the local TV, newspaper, um, we also do the uh, use the internet, of course. Really, any other any any avenue or, or any way to get the message out to disseminate this, um, and just uh, trying to bring to justice those responsible for terrorist attacks against the U.S. And it's obviously it's working. Yeah, and it, it really it is working. It continues to be one of the most valuable assets for the U.S. government in the fight against terrorism. And really, and you think about it, who better to administer the program than diplomatic security, mm -hmm. especially considering that we've got agents that are located uh, at anywhere that the U.S. government has a diplomatic presence. Right. Mike, I also was reading about the Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program. Tell folks about that. Sure. This is a program that's been around since 1983, and it's dedicated to providing training and equipment to foreign law enforcement and security organizations in order to enhance their capabilities and capacity to detect, deter, counter, and, and investigate terrorist activities. Um, since 1983, they've trained and assisted more than 84,000 foreign law enforcement and security personnel from 154 different countries. Um, so the, the agents assigned will go out and um, <clears throat> do an assessment of these different law enforcement and security organizations to determine what training they need, and then they can either bring um, law enforcement personnel back to the United States, or they can conduct the training in their um, home country, or they can bring them to one of the four international law enforcement academies throughout the world. And the training might be anything from bomb detection, crime scene investigation, or VIP training. Todd, what advice would you give to, to someone that uh, might be watching that thinks they want to become a diplomatic security agent? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, this has been a great career for me, yeah. being able to serve my country for over 25 years. 
Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to share with the listeners um, sort of the basic requirements to becoming a, a DS, a Diplomatic Security Special Agent. Uh, most people think you have to have a law enforcement background, and uh, that necessarily isn't the case. Um, the, the two biggest requirements uh, are a completion of a four-year degree from an accredited university and meeting the age requirements uh, that are shown here. Um, in addition to uh, special agents, uh, diplomatic security also employs security engineering officers and security technical specialists um, that deal with um, all the technical security work, mostly in an embassy overseas. Um, for someone that's in college that's considering a, a career with the State Department with diplomatic security, um, I'd encourage you to look into internships. Uh, the department offers many of those and that provides sort of some good insight there. Um, all applicants or prospective applicants must be able to pass a, a pretty thorough uh, background investigation and a medical examination. And as we discussed earlier, um, be available for worldwide assignment. Wow, yeah. excellent. So what attracted you to this position? Talk, talk a little bit about yeah, I mean, your I knew, background, your career path. Uh, I knew at an early age that I wanted to serve uh, uh, as a, a federal law enforcement officer. I've always liked to travel and explore and, and see things, learn new languages. So for me, this was sort of a combination, the, the best of all these different worlds combined. And um, I also like to conduct criminal investigations. And when I'm serving overseas, um, not only do we conduct passport and visa fraud investigations, but really any type of criminal investigation that, that happens uh, on a U.S. government compound, we're going to take the lead as far as that goes. There, there are a few exceptions. Um, I've tackled a number of really challenging projects over the years, and, and one that stands out was uh, when I was assigned to Ljubljana, Slovenia, which is just south of Austria. It's a, wow. one of the, the first of the breakaway um, republics okay. from Yugoslavia. It was a startup embassy, and I, I arrived there a couple years after uh, they opened operations, but it was still um, in its infancy. They were building a lot of programs. I was able to launch a, a number of security programs. Uh, we, we moved into a new embassy. We got Marines there. So it really was challenging, but very rewarding at the same time. And how long have you been in Boston? I've been here since last year. I, I served here for about three years in the mid-90s. So even though I'm not from this area, it is a little bit like coming back home. Mike, how about you? Um, public service was always very important to me, um, and I um, gained a, a real interest in federal, getting a job in federal law enforcement. And um, right around the 1998 embassy bombings, I learned more about DS, and it made it a, uh, an agency with a mission that I wanted to be a part of. Um, so I was lucky enough to join, and it's, it's just been a, a great, great career. Um, a lot of travel, a lot of new experiences, a uh, chance to interact and, and learn new languages and see new cultures. Nice. Well, thank you. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you think the folks at home need to know? Um, just, just one last comment. Um, as I mentioned, I've been on this job a number of years, and uh, no two days are alike. I mean, uh, that really holds mm -hmm. true for this position. It's always something new. I, I, we move around every couple of years, so that keeps us sharp and focused. I remember a number of years ago, I did an uh, interview with a reporter, and they asked, you know, what's the most appealing part of the job? And I said, well, one day I'm at my desk writing up a report for a criminal investigation. Uh, a day or two later, I'm flying halfway around the world uh, in response to some sort of security crisis, or perhaps it's uh, uh, augmenting security for a Secretary of State trip. So it really keeps you on your toes. Uh, we get to see the world and travel, and, and also living and serving overseas. Uh, you meet a lot of people from different cultures, and and uh, that really uh, builds character, and I think um, most of all, it gives you a, a better appreciation for being an American citizen. Our time is up. Thank um, you very much. Was, so thank, yeah. thank you both. Um, thank you. Again, uh, thanks to our guests for joining us and for helping us to better understand the work of the United States Diplomatic Security Service. I thank you for watching, and I hope that you will continue to join us as we feature other federal agencies on your federal government.